welcome back welcome back this is the activity to template which you are given so before i do anything else the first thing i would recommend everyone do is make a copy of all of this reason being you're going to be doing this as many times as you have threats so if you have 10 threats you're going to do this roughly 10 times unless you can join some of them so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to copy this highlight everything let me zoom in everything up to where it says use the section headings i'm going to copy that and i'm going to paste it right underneath maybe on a new page and always have that empty one at the top so you can copy and paste it for when you need it after i've now copied my blank one i'm going to start to fill this in let me zoom in the first one i'm going to use is actually one that i'm going to steal directly from the examiner's report so again I, I believe i put links in the description of the examiner's report which i have on my google drive so have a look on that document as well this was taken directly from there i'm going to change the words around to make it as clear as possible but essentially what the issue was was a misconfigured wi-fi or ssid or um, the network name so wi-fi is the same as ssid is the same as the name of the network so the name of your wi-fi now this is an issue because remember the wi-fi is being broadcasted by the main router that's number one we have the staff wi-fi also being broadcasted and we also have the visitor wi-fi being broadcasted so this is just a shortened version of saying all of that this is how they've said it threats addressed by the protection measure and again this was copied directly from the examiner's report so it's going to be very detailed and this is what they said are so good answers so misconfigured wi-fi ssid or network name again that's that's the issue that i found details of actions to be taken Check the SSIDs of the network and reconfigure them to what is needed. Taking measures to not show the staff one to the public, so that's the visitors one, or even using MAC addresses to only allow devices approved by the network to be connected to the staff network. What does this mean? Let me try and give some context again. What this means is that if your device is not or has not been um, added to the list of uh, allowed devices, so just like your school ID, when you tap it on the doors and on, on certain places in school, you can get access to certain places. If your device, laptop, mobile phone, tablet, whatever you have, is not allowed by using a MAC address, and keep in mind the MAC address is a physical address, it will never, ever, ever change. No matter how many times you reset your device, you restart your device, the MAC address will never change. So if the address that will never change is picked up as being an address that is not allowed to use the network, if when you tap your card, you're not allowed into the teacher's cafeteria room, for example, then the door simply won't open. This is the same concept. If you try to log into the Wi-Fi and you're not allowed to be on there, it will simply say you're not allowed to connect or it will simply say no internet access. It will simply kick you off. That's what it means. Now we have reason, let me zoom in some more, reasons for actions. If the staff network is visible to visitors, this can cause seven, I think this was supposed to be several potential threats, as it would allow people to try and gain access to the network via attacks or password infiltration, for which if the staff network is not visible to the public, it would mean that scammers may not be able to pick up the network and would only see the visitor one which even if access won't allow people into the staff only section of the network, normally routers would come with a default username and a strong password. However, in some cases, old routers or routers may not have that and may have weaker passwords, which could be uh, easier to crack. Quite a few things to unpick here. So let me try and separate them as best I can. Let's do that one first. And then the next one, yeah. So. Yes, this person is 100% insane. If the staff network is visible to visitors, uh, there could be some issue there. So think of it like this. Any Wi-Fi network that's visible is hackable. It's that simple. And if someone has enough time and enough resources, they can hack or get into your Wi-Fi. It's that simple. So if you make your, your staff Wi-Fi not visible, because keep in mind, people that connect to the staff Wi-Fi probably use their work laptops to to get into very secure locations on the network, on the servers, and they can access a lot more. So if you as a random person, if you can connect to the staff Wi-Fi and get into the staff areas of the network, that could be detrimental to the system or to the company itself because you shouldn't be there. Another thing is uh, just simply make it not visible. So when you make it not visible, no one else can see it. 
and the other section they added are normally routes yes so routers routers whenever you try to access them they normally come with default username and passwords so if people know these default username and passwords or if there's a way to figure out how to crack them easily and yours has not been changed it's a very very good idea to one million percent change the default username and password for anything so when you plug your router in for the first time it might the username might be admin the password might be admin in many cases it actually is and that allows easier access next we have overview of constraints technical and financial so again technical is is this thing possible do we currently have technology present on this planet uh, in this country in this office to do what we want to do and in this instance it's going to be yes uh, can we actually find a technical person to do it? Yeah, Sync could probably do this to be fair, but you ideally want a network specialist. And financial, is it going to cost us a lot of money to do this? Um, and, that, and at the end, we have the, uh, the, the cost benefit analysis again. So this kind of linked to that one as well. So technical, they've said minimal technical constraints as most routers or routers come with settings to configure MAC addresses for the network, along with the internet being available to provide help to the user. However, sometimes there can be a limit to how many MAC addresses can be entered, may not be enough for all staff. Finance, uh, that is true as well, but again, if you, it depends on the size of the company. If you're a known small company, right? So let's say me and my friends over at Checkpoint or I hire, start hiring people at Runs Tech Up and I hire roughly 10, 15, 20 people. My home router, my home router will easily be able to access or accept 10 MAC addresses as being blocked or being allowed. However, if I'm using my normal consumer, that's just normal people who buy stuff, my normal consumer router in a company like, let's say, my college, which has, I'm going to say, 500 members of staff from teachers to cleaners to lunch people to admin staff, everyone adds up to about 500 roughly. I'm just exaggerating here. That might become too much. So I will most likely need an industrial router or router to be able to accept all these MAC addresses and all these rules I want to put in. It's going to need to be something more um, heavy duty, something more serious. Next, we have financial minimal. If router MAC address limit is reached within router, contact ISP, that's internet service provider, your Virgin, your O2, your BT, your TalkTalk. So you contact your internet service provider to find out cost for more or just go industrial. So you could buy a Meraki one, you could buy a Cisco one, and they will just come with these features as standard. Maybe you have, let's say, a Word document or a text file, and every time someone needs access, you put uh, their MAC address into the allowed access text file, and every time someone needs to be blocked, you put their information into the blocked MAC address text file. As a basic example, uh, overview of legal responsibilities, none. Data is not affected during a protection measure. So yeah, no one, there is nothing to really consider with this one. I remember the, f uh, the four acts I spoke about, if I can re even remember them now. We have Data Protection Act, Computer Misuse Act, uh, Copyright uh, Patent Act, and we have Health and Safety Act. To be fair, nothing is going to be in, um, impacted here because it's just Wi-Fi. It's nothing crazy extreme. It's not like we're telling customers, you can never have your data. We're going to hold your data forever. We're going to sell your data if you want to. It's nothing crazy like that. Overview of usability of the system. And again, usability links to how easy it is to learn how to use the system or how to use the system in general. Now, this new system, they said it's going to be minimal changes made to the system itself. System should be used as normal yes and no i would agree and disagree with this it is minimal yes it is not the end of the world it's not the hardest thing to do but imagine coming into work one day on a monday you're like oh brand new job brand new phone you log into your phone you see staff wi-fi you log in with your email address and password everything works perfectly fine on a monday then on a tuesday you come in you turn your wi-fi on at work and it just doesn't pick up anything but other people are using theirs perfectly fine now, what you have to do, what I actually had to do is go to my IT department and say to them, um, I need to connect to the network using my personal device and they'll set it up for you. So every device you have, I have a, a mobile phone, I have a tablet, I have one or two personal laptops, one has Windows, one has another operating system. So every single device I need to connect to the network, I need to go to IT. In the grand scheme of things, it's not going to be an issue, but minimal, yes, but there might be some annoyances, but that's fine.
Next, we have um, outline cost and benefit. The benefits outweigh the cost in this protection measure. I agree 1 million percent. Let's just imagine uh, the SSIDs, the Wi-Fi's weren't configured properly. Let's just imagine that the staff Wi-Fi was visible to everyone. Let's imagine that the main router, which was in the image um, from the exam paper, was visible to everyone. What could potentially happen is this. If someone hacks into that system and gains access to all the data on there, remember, they did not say the server was encrypted. They did not say there was any... Um, I think they did mention that this, 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 the system needed a firewall. So there's no firewall currently, and the server is not encrypted. So if someone gets access to the server or the systems, they get access to all the data. And getting access to all the data could potentially cost the company a lot of money, not only to recover the data if someone tries to steal it. That's number one. It's going to cost the company if the people whose data, uh, details are stolen decide, whoa, we're going to sue you. Imagine Microsoft had the brand new Xbox Series X2 right and this company because of their bad security measures has those details stolen microsoft is probably going to sue them and win right so there are benefits um to having pay someone to do this initially and the benefits outweigh the cost it, yes it might cost a thousand pounds to set up initially but again if your system doesn't get hacked if there's no downtime if everything works as it should then this is a benefit and lastly we have test plan I think the only one that they did was the first one. I made up the last two myself. So test number, you simply put number one if it's the first test, number two if it's the second test, number three if it's the third test, so on and so forth. I wouldn't do any more than about three or four tests for each thing unless it's like a joint one and there are loads of things that you, you can test. Three or four is okay. Remember, you only have two and a half hours to complete this. So you don't want to spend all your time uh, looking for tests. And again, it doesn't need to be too detailed. These descriptions are perfectly fine based on what I've seen on the examiner's report. And they've even said it doesn't need to be too detailed. So my first test, num test number one, my test description, what am I testing? I'm going to scan for all three networks. And in my case, I've said uh, the, the main router has Wi-Fi on there. I don't know if the Wi-Fi was turned on or not, but I could see the Wi-Fi symbol over the router. Let me go to the exam paper, actually. Let me just go and find it quickly. Bear with me one second. It's in here. 2018, past paper. And it's going to be this one. So if I go back to the diagram, which is here, I could see the Wi-Fi signal on the main router. Now, I don't know if it's on, but I don't care. Let's just assume it is, right? So it's going to be main Wi-Fi router, and we have the guest Wi-Fi router, or, or the guest um, Wi-Fi, sorry, and we have the staff Wi-Fi as well. Let me go back to my document. So I'm going to scan for all three networks. And remember, I said that only the visitor Wi-Fi should be seen. The only visitor Wi-Fi should be left as discoverable. And discoverable, again, means searchable. I should not see the other two. So I should not see, sorry, I should not see uh, main router and I should not see staff. I should only see guest or visitor. And if staff and main router are visible, the devices should be reconfigured. So we should go back in, turn those Wi-Fi's off or, or make them not discoverable and add them manually to people's devices by using a MAC address, for example. Staff passwords should change every X months. Um, I think at most schools and colleges for teachers and just general members of staff, it's about three or four months, so like three or four times per year that you have to change your password. It does become a bit annoying because you have to keep thinking of a new password, but it is very good because if someone does get access to the details or uh, your password or you leave your laptop somewhere, someone gets access, at least you know that at some point they will no longer have access. And even so, the access that they have is going to be limited because of the MAC address, because of the access control list. So that's known as an ACL. That's something you should have gone over as well. The access control list does exactly as the name says. It tells who has access to what, for how long, and in some cases, when. Um, so let me go back to this. Sorry. Staff passwords should change every X months. An email or device prompt should be sent to staff to alert them their passwords need to be changed by X date. So let's say it's the 1st of January now, it changes every three months. So roughly by the end of March, you should change your password again. And that could just be sent as a message on their phone because they're connected to the Wi Fi. You can send messages. Or if it's a staff member, which in this case it is, you can simply send an email to let them know your password is going to expire by the 31st of, what did I say, March. So please change it before that date. Uh, next thing I have under possible further actions following tests. If this works, no action is needed. 
which means that if the message is sent out, if they change a password, no action is needed. If it does not work, the system needs to be set up or reconfigured to do this. To do what exactly? To send out a prompt or send out an email or send out a text message to let the person know your details um, need to be changed at some point. Uh, num number three, it says block users in order to see if they are still allowed to connect to the network. So that's um, the description of the test. This is test number three, by the way. And the expected outcome should be blocked users should not be able, not allowed, not be able or allowed is fine, to connect to the system, staff or visitor. So it doesn't matter if you're staff, it doesn't matter if you're a visitor. Once your MAC address has been blocked on the system, you should not be able to reconnect whatsoever. Some staff members come to school and they abuse it. I mean, to be fair, I'm one of those staff members because I'm one of those people. I edit my videos at home, maybe I come to school. And because my internet at home is so bad, I can upload 100 megabits per second sometimes at school. That's roughly three, four times faster than me doing it at home. So sometimes I come to school and I upload stuff. So I might get banned one day. I don't know. If a blocked user is still able to connect, the policies need to be revisited. Uh, the system needs to be set up or reconfigured again. So if you're blocked, imagine this, you've been blocked by the system and one day you come in and you try to reconnect to it and, and everything just works fine. That's an issue. A customer might have been blocked as well. They might have been an attacker and one day they walk by the shop, they come in again and they try and everything works just fine with the same device. That's a big issue. The next one I have is no encryption. Let me zoom in no encryption on the servers and again these servers should very much be encrypted because they are holding trade secrets and trade secrets are secrets a company doesn't want to be leaked doesn't want to get into the competition's hand for example this uh, details of actions to be taken the server needs to be configured so that it has the highest necessary form of encryption that the company can afford let's say this can be done by Sing using the instruction manual received when the servers were bought or from the software or hardware manufacturer's website. So a server is essentially a big, massive, super fast computer. I'm trying to actually buy a server. Now I need about 24 cores. I need 128 gigabytes of RAM. I'm going to need about six to eight hard drives so I can run RAID 0. So I think of a server as simply a big, heavy, fast computer. So it's going to be both software and hardware and you need to you can purchase the type of encryption that you want most of the server operating systems come with really good encryption so it's up to you it would also be possible to bring in a network specialist to do the to do the job with them being monitored at all stages and you want to monitor them because again they're a freelancer they're coming from outside they don't work for your company they have they have no real loyalty to your company you pay them and they do the job in some cases freelancers have stolen before so you want to have them monitored at all stages maybe have a camera over their backs while they're working so that everything that they type in on screen you can see every action that they do on screen you can see you can monitor it you can have someone stand behind them as well whatever you think is best reasons for these actions or for the actions if the server is not encrypted an attacker might gain access to the system and in turn to people's data they will have the ability to view the data. Encryption would make it impossible or at least not feasible for the attacker to try and make use of the data, even if they got their hands on it. Now, even if someone hacks something, the reason you want it to be encrypted is so that if they hack it, let's say you had a Word document with all your passwords in it and you encrypt it. Even if someone else gets hold of that Word document because they do not have the encryption key, because they don't know the cipher that was used, they don't know the algorithm that was used, it's going to be very, very hard for them to crack it. And in some cases, it can take hundreds or thousands of years to crack that information. So it's not feasible for a single person or a company or group to wait two, three, four hundred years to crack something when we're all going to be dead by then, right? Pretty grim, I'm sorry. Overview of constraints. Technical and financial. Now, I just came up with a mini um, scale. So I'm going to say uh, low, intermediate, high, and very high, maybe. We could probably use something back from the risk severity matrix, but it's entirely up to you. And for financial, I'm going to say low, medium, and high. So for technical, I'm going to say this is relatively intermediate or low. This is possible, uh, but might require a more advanced practitioner than Singh if there is not much information out there on how to do this properly. Now, again, you can typically consult the website or the manual from the person or the company you bought the, the server from. 
Financial, I'm going to say medium or low. If Singh is not capable of doing this task, a network specialist would need to be brought in to configure the hardware and software as is needed. Um, again, you can pay them. Let's let's just say for argument's sake, you don't pay them for a day. You pay them for two, three, four, five days. Yes, it might cost you a, as a company a couple grand to do this. But again, the benefits outweigh the actual cost of it. And I'm going to leave that part until I get down to cost um, cost cost benefit. So outline of legal responsibilities for this one. I've gone overboard. I think I've mentioned data protection act, computer misuse, misuse acts, copyright designs and patent act. And I say they all need to be considered as there are most as there is most likely trade secrets on the servers. So the data protection act, the company needs to ensure there is sufficient security on all its devices, which would lower the risk of their customers or clients details being leaked or hacked or infiltrated, whatever word you want to use. The Computer Misuse Act, if external and internal people become aware of the server not being protected, this could cause them to try and attack the system. This is even more important for an internal person as it would be much easier for them to gain unauthorized access, whether it be physically or digitally. So because you work for the company, you can simply slip into the server room at some point and um, plug something in and copy everything off or digitally, you know that the server is not protected. So even if you don't have access, the person you sit next to, your manager might have access. They might leave their PC um, careless at one point and you think, oh, I can get access now. You jump onto their laptop. You can see everything on the server. You copy it off, send it to yourself, whatever the case is. Uh, Copyright Design and Patents Act, holding the trade secrets of others carelessly could mean the company, though not directly involved in the sharing of such content, could be part of some legal action by the originator of the content. Yeah, what that means, this is one I came up with as well. Again, I'm reaching, I know. Imagine you're being paid by a company. You have all their details. You have all their trade secrets, but you didn't set your system up properly. So because of that, it can be proven or it can be proved that you didn't set up your system properly. So someone was very, very quickly and easily able to access the system, copy the data off and they can see the data because it was not encrypted. You could be sued as well because you did not take the correct measures when holding someone's data. So that's something that you need to consider as well. Overview of usability of the system. There will be very little change for the normal users as they will not see the change in some cases. This will be very little change for the normal users as they will not see any change or not see much change. If the system has been configured to allow some users access and others none, it might be a case or it might be good where they have to log into the server so that there's a log when they have logged in. Uh, what they viewed or access. This is to ensure that there is a trail or a log. All I'm saying here is um, the system shouldn't change much for many people. If the network engineer or the network specialist comes in and sets everything up okay, once you log in, you should have access to the encrypted stuff. In some cases where it's super, super secure, what might happen is every time you try to go to that server to view something, open something, copy something, you might have to type in a password, a username, whatever the case is. Reason being, it's a good idea to have a trail or a log of everyone who actually access the system is going to have time, date, username, everything. And then if something were to happen under your username in the time that you logged in, in the time that you were at work, then there are going to be questions asked. Outline cost of benefit. And I say massive benefits cost wise. It, uh, it could be done for free by seeing if the manufacturer has good, clear instructions. In any case, this will prevent trade secrets and personal data from getting into the hands of, uh, and I'm just going to say hackers here. Hackers or attackers is, is used very loosely. So just people that um, want to do bad stuff, uh, attackers. Okay, the test plan next. I've got two tests here, so I didn't go overboard with the tests. Test plan, uh, test number is number one. The test description, have a user who does not have access to the server try to access it. Uh, expected outcome, the user should not be allowed entry. That's quite simple. They shouldn't be allowed to access anything. They shouldn't even see anything. If the user is allowed entry, this issue needs to be rectified immediately by not boo, by reconfiguring. Now, you might want to do another one as well, which is to actually get someone who has access to the system. So this could be test number two or three. Get someone who should have access to the system. Let them access the system normally. And it should, 
I would say use the password prompt. So when they try to access the system, they should ask for a password prompt. If it does not ask for a password prompt and lets them in, that's an issue as well. That's maybe another one you could add for something like this. Have a white hat hacker come into the company and try to find vulnerabilities in the system. This is not the best idea in the world, but again, depends on the company. If you're a massive, massive bank, if you're a massive, massive phone company, you want to know where the weaknesses are, this might be a good option because you bring a known hacker into the system, but they are a white hat hacker, so they're good hackers. They're people that actually do this for a living. The hacker should not be able to access the system. In the event they do, they should not be able to make use of any of the data. Right, that's the expected outcome and for possible further action following test. If the hacker gets into the system, it needs to be patched immediately. So wherever they find a weakness, we go and patch that issue, we go and fix that issue straight away. If they manage to get the data and it is feasible for them to make it readable, put better encryption in place. All this means if they manage to get the data and when they're trying to crack it, it takes them, I don't know, two, three days, one hour, however long, then that's going to be an issue. So we need to have much better encryption in place. So it takes them a lot longer. If a hacker gets a piece of data and with their current system or technology, it says it's going to take them 3000 years to get through this data. There's absolutely no point for them to continue unless they just want to do it for fun. You know what? I'm going to stop there. I'm going to leave it at only two of them. Hopefully those were clear enough. Uh, any questions you have, please post them under this video or post them on the community tab and I'll try my best to answer as many as I can. Thank you for watching. Good luck. Hopefully this was useful.